I think that we're all holding two poles right right now and and they're the very ends of those spectrum one is in our field in particular when we're thinking about what the opportunity is here it is there's a tremendous opportunity there's a moment that we've all gotten still enough to see what's really happening in the world and on the flip of that there's this incredible amount of pain right in the unknowing in death in in triage and the things that most people live their lives oblivious to right and so there's it's all on the table right now and i feel like as a long-term organizer and advocate um usually you feel like you're holding up a wall and right now it feels like the wall has disappeared and everybody's kind of just looking at us being like okay what's next <laughs> Mark Brand is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by Innovators Magazine and 1.5 Media. Mark is a social impact entrepreneur, chef, and professor of innovation. Mark is one of North America's foremost social entrepreneurs with 11 businesses under his belt. He exemplifies a new form of leadership that encompasses good in every step. Brand is determined to breathe new life into our struggling and disjointed communities through his advocacy, convenings, and social impact business models. Along with overseeing the five organizations under MB Incorporated, Mark Brand leads his A Better Life Foundation in Canada, the United States, and Mexico, and is a Stanford Fellow, Professor of Innovation and Design Thinking, and has served as Executive Chef for the American Refugee Committee and Pope Francis's Climate Challenge. As a certified integral facilitator and mediator, he helps to unstick groups facing deep challenges through design. At the center of all this work, is helping us see ways to help each other in meaningful and long lasting ways with the theory, there is no us and them, only us. Mark, my friend, it is so good to have you here and to see your beautiful smiling face on the other end. How have you been? I, I have been like many of us and let me also echo that. It's wonderful to be here and to see you. Uh, I think that we're all holding two poles right right now and and they're the very ends of those spectrum one is in our field in particular when we're thinking about what the opportunity is here it is there's a tremendous opportunity there's a moment that we've all gotten still enough to see what's really happening in the world and on the flip of that there's this incredible amount of pain right in the unknowing in death in in triage and the things that most people live their lives oblivious to Right. And so there's, it's all on the table right now. And I feel like as a long-term organizer and advocate, um, usually you feel like you're holding up a wall and right now it feels like the wall has disappeared and everybody's kind of just looking at us being like, okay, what's next? Um, and so it, it's, it's uh, a little bit of a and B brother. Has all, uh, so, I mean, for, first of all, that was just a short synopsis of everything you've done over the years. You've been very active and busy and had a wonderful, not, not just rock star type of uh, life, but also very fabulous for helping and advocacy and food. Um, ha has any of that prepared or given you some extra resilience or help to, to be in a unique position to help others during this time? Have you said, wow, I'm so glad that I went through this years ago that now I'm in this unique position? Very much so. I think, you know, um, the analogy is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? And so yes. we, we perpetuate that onto our social circles and our children and our families. And we're like, look, you made it through. And so we've been making it through those struggles my, my whole life personally and then professionally for the last 10 or 12 as we started one particular business and I'm in Vancouver right now, BC, in the downtown east side, which is the center of the opioid epidemic. And we started a business here in 2010. And before anybody was comfortable saying the word social impact entrepreneur, together they would be like, you mess those up, those don't go together. Now it's everyday vernacular. Before people were super familiar with B corporations, right? Benefit Corps. We were one of the first in, in on that. And so 
we are used to being at the forefront of that envelope in trying to push and see. Like you don't know that you are, but you're trying to figure things out and prototyping. And when you're doing that, all these traditional structures that would support that do not. They don't support that. They're like it's too risk advert. Like this is too risk heavy. We don't want to do that. And so we've been cobbling it together, which really puts us in a place of triage constantly, right? And so when you are in that sort of modality, you realize that everything's okay here. This is a safe space, right? It's not as comfortable, but it starts to be a little bit more. And then you get comfortable in the discomfort. And when you get to that space and you can see cleanly and clearly, you're not spinning, you're in flow state in triage, everything is possible. And so for us, when this crisis hit, you can imagine one of the first things to go is street level food for people who are unhoused. So all the people would come out and do outreach and have mobile soup kitchens and hand out sandwiches and all that disappeared. So you've got a population of over 30,000 people who are used to having a bunch of food come to the neighborhood plus our program who now don't have any options. So we increased our output by about 250% with government partner. Fabulous. Uh, it was wonderful. And so we were in a unique position because I built the brick and mortar ready to scale for these moments. Uh, so it, it really helped us show our value in the way that we could show up, but also be able to be there as an ear and a guiding hand for everybody from municipal politicians um, through to frontline organizations who are like, now what do we do? Our whole business is built on being with each other. And so, yeah, I, I think we were we were pre as prepared as anybody could be. Don't let me, it's four months in, right? So I'm a little more settled now, but as prepared as you could be um, to deal with this sort of a crisis is it's, yeah, it's in our training for certain. I'm so glad to hear and I'm so glad to see that you made it through. I, I had no doubts that it would be you standing on the other end, uh, uh, helping others and, and doing that. Is there any special shout outs that you'd like to give to any special organizations or heroes during this time that helped you or assisted you or that you partnered with? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the one that comes top to mind is Atira Women's Resource Center and um, the CEO over there, Janice Abbott, who's been a just a tremendous ally uh, in helping me understand the work going back to the first day that I stepped in the neighborhood, essentially. And Janice and Atira have been uh, helping women and children who flee violence and in indigenous populations here in the downtown east side for over 30 years. And they're just spectacular people. And, and they, know, they know it, they get it, they're about it. And um, they are the partner that stood up with us and helped us put this whole thing together. And then that's a us together is like an organization. Imagine the mycelium of social networks here. We're all on high alert. And so every other organization, um, I, I would spend our entire hour and a half. Yeah, I believe regaling them. So I, it's just, been I, I just wanted to give a chance because I know it, you know, it, it's not just one, it's us. And uh, mm -hmm. as I said in your introduction, so um, I really uh, appreciate that. Do, do you, did, is there anything I left out in the, your introduction or an update that you would like to give, give our listeners of maybe something I left out or what, where are you now and where are you moving forward? What's kind of, what can we expect from, from compound brand? Yeah, I, I think that you did a wonderful job and I, um, it's interesting how we react as humans to our accolades as they're known being said back to us. I get, I still get uncomfortable. Um, you, you, of course you have pride, but then you're like, oh yeah, no, that's okay. It's okay to have done those things. It's, it's totally fine. Uh, we're just built that way. And so I think what's also interesting is that the way that we operate, everything that you said to me, and we know this about each other is one thing, right? And that last line really encompasses that is I have a bunch of tools in my tool belt. Those tools are charitable organizations, for-profits, non-profits, a whole bunch of chefs at the go on this side, a whole bunch of design thinkers on this side, you know, and then all of the different people. And all we want is for everybody to be safe and healthy and happy, right? And so people are like, it's so complex what you do. I'm like, it, it isn't. It is, but it isn't. But really all we want is that. And we want to have a bright future for everybody. So we want to think five, 10, 15, 20 generations ahead and say, what are we doing right now? Because we were left with, a dumpster fire, right? Yes. That's what we were left with. For sure. And, and we're aware of it. And instead of pointing fingers and getting angry, because that's just not helpful, we already went through that phase of grief. 
what can we do? And so Mark, right now I'm focused on how can I be best of service personally as a tool in conversations like this and working with our dear friends at the Future Food Institute and the FAO? How can I help with all of the archetypes that we've built um, that aren't complex? They're intentionally easy to understand regardless of where you are. Um, how can I help to get those into places that provide comfort to people who are marginalized? And so all the rest of the stuff on the outside is um, just simply tools and mechanisms and devices that we use to achieve those goals of safety and happiness and health. We're so, or I was blessed. Let's, let's start that way. I was blessed to meet you this year in um, Bangkok, Thailand, more specifically right. Chantaburi, Chantaboon, uh, um, and at a chef's cook-off and, and also uh, many other chefs, but it was just a wonderful time. And your artistry, your uh, um, deep interaction with everyone there to not only do sustainable meal, but to value and cherish everyone who was in your kitchen, on your staff as a help, as providing the raw goods to using food waste was absolutely mind blowing. And uh, the dishes, uh, even though they were for the elderly, I must say I snuck, uh, snuck some, some <laughs> tastings for myself. Okay. They were absolutely fabulous, but it was just like a, a symphony, a concert being produced that was unbelievable to watch you. And it wasn't just a few hours, but you spent a couple of days preparing and, and uh, thinking about traditional, indigenous, sustainable uh, uh, what kind of packaging, how can I do it? And it was just fabulous. And, and that's that for our listeners, that's how we met, but I just, uh, uh, um, I fell in love with you. You're a great man. And, and I loved uh, your, your, your talk that you gave at sustainable brands on stage. And I also love the, the, uh, kind heartedness and, and the, the, the ways you touch so many people's lives and it touched my life. And I thank you for that. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad I, ha I was fortunate enough to meet you. So I thank you for that. It was not a question. I just wanted our listeners to know and Jeez. to let you know openly. So uh, it's, there's no secret. Um, well, thank you for the reflection. And it, it means a lot to me. And ultimately when you're in that work, um, you go to your skills, right? And uh the gift of also meeting you and being in Thailand and being with the people who could put us into the places of deep, deep trust. I got to spend what came resonant for me when you were just talking about that, a day with generational farmers on their farm. And I have had the blessed life to be able to travel to a lot of those places behind your head and eat cuisine and, and dig into what I had never had an experience like I had in Chantaburi which was being with this generational farmer who spoke no English. We had no translator, there was no need. And I was there with his son who was two and he, the three of us just walked through the bush and his totally natural growing farm. So there's no lines, it's just proper farming. And he's pulling leaves off and handing them to me and I'm putting them in my mouth and I'm, I'm trying not to like look like a crazy person, right? Because I'm in a complete amazement. I'm like, this tastes like a niece, but what is this tree? And it just went on and on and on and on. And then we went to the market together and I saw a real tiger prawn for the first time. And it was this big. And folks, I'm six foot two, yes. 235 pounds. Yes. It was this bit in my hand. Huge. And I'd seen gamba prawns, of course, in like Portugal or in Madagascar, but it just, these, the ability and the opportunity to be in different places to understand that we get so caught up in the singular, the I, the ego, to be able to go out and be like, there's so much beauty and amazing things worth us investing every source and like moment of our being and trying to save all of this, right? So I think that's where you and I both deeply connected was the awareness of the gift and being able to cook uh, and have a chef battle with a Michelin star chef in an elderly facility was also yes. something that I will cherish for the rest of my life. Yes, uh, uh, It was just very beautiful, but I think the analogies in there are, 
no matter our privilege or the gifts of what we've seen, there's always so much more to see. And we just, I want that for everybody for many generations to go. It's important. Well, this behind me is not only um, a map of our world, but it's also the World Bank. It's also the World Kitchen, okay. as we have learned, as we've, we travel around, all our resources, our kitchen is here. And as uh, Thailand is, <clears throat> is said to be the kitchen of the world, and, and by, by many quotes and, and discussions, because the diversity, the amount of uh, fabulous food is just, just amazing. And it's an eye opener to not only to cook there, to see those great chefs, but to see the indigenous and local people cook in, in the markets. It's, it's a fabulous experience and, and I love it. I go there uh, at least four to five times a year and I, I really, really loved it. And I loved it more because of the experience of meeting you and the hospitality of P. Nui and sustainable mm -hmm. brands. And she's also contributing in, in my book, Menu B, as well for our listeners, you are as well. And, right. and, and so I'm so thankful and thank you for those contributions because there are voices around food and things that people need to, to hear. This leads us nicely into the, the first question. It's really, uh, in some respect, I call myself a global citizen from the moment I was born. My father's American, my mother's German, my grandfather was German, my grandmother was Austrian and Spanish and, and Italian and uh, family members from all over the world and at a young age was doing that. You've also traveled the world and been very diverse uh, in, in, in that. How do you feel about global citizenship? And what if in the future there were no borders, limitations, or walls out there? How do you feel about that? What, what kind of a, a response do you have to, to that uh, kind of tag as a global citizen? So in the, in the current iteration of this planet, um, I say it, and I know that it comes with a deep white male privilege, right? So I want to acknowledge that, that I also would like to quickly acknowledge, uh, and just because it's uh, incredibly important that I'm currently on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Snohomish, and Squamish peoples, um, and Salatooth peoples, uh, and this thought of borders by presencing them in the ancestral territories that I occupy right now that I'm blessed enough to be on, um, those borders didn't exist. We created these, capitalism created these borders and domination and, and conquering created these borders. And this is, it's new, right? It's in the big scheme of things, it's very new and it's a failed experiment. It, the experiment failed. It has done nothing but be divisive. Visibly, yeah. It just, it's, it's that between those and religious sectarianism, those two things together have just destroyed so much. And so if I could, if a genie popped out of a bottle right over here and was like, hey, I got three for you. You've done good work. You know, number one would be eradicate any, any divisiveness. Right. I'd want to be, I want to be at 30,000 feet with it. Cause I could like bring in a lot of stuff and cheat with that one just eradicate that divisiveness. And in, in practice, what is that? The borders. So before this was all happening, I was planning a border called love that sort of dinner at the border in um, San Diego in Tijuana at the actual border structure called love thy neighbor. And we were going to do a giant heart shaped table from the roof that would connect on both sides. And I had chefs going U S and Canadian chefs going over to Mexico and Mexican chefs coming over. And the border patrol got wind of this and they were not excited about what I was going to do, but we were with the friendship society who owns the park there or doesn't own it has regulations to the park there, but there's so much sketchy. I want to say black op like enforcement going on around the U S border. For what? Really, I mean, seriously, it got so touchy and I was like, we're still doing it. So my team was like, well, you're going to be on the Mexico side. So you don't go get lost in some hole somewhere. Um, and we're going to execute this dinner. And when I started to talk about it, the energy that came behind it, because it was, it was commentary on the ridiculousness of the border. If I can step one direction this way or one direction this way, the landmass is intrinsic, right? Like we are on one energetic space. The Latin American people are, I, I hate to pick favorites, 
right? But the top three for me of all time are the Mexican people. Like, I just can't get enough of the way that they live their lives, the, the food, their just deep respect for each other, the love. And if there's ever been bad PR agents, Mexico's had some bad PR agents because you've spent time. Like you and I talked about Mexico City for probably two hours yeah, in the car. Yeah. I adore it. And so what, with the borders disappearing, people get to have the experiences that we're discussing, right? People have these misnomers about Canada in the US that just blow me away every time. Like you're Canadian. Oh, it must be cold. I'm like, it's 2020. You have the internet. Are you serious right now? Is this a real question? Yes. <laughs> no polar. I don't ride a polar bear to work. Right? It's, <laughs> we're on Caribou. the same landmass. Like, what are you, what are you thinking? And it just, it really points out to a deep failure in education, um, a deep failure uh, in, in these border states, in the divisiveness of our political parties globally. And what's going on. So I, I believe if we were no longer restricted and people could just be and just travel, um, we would be in a much different place than we are now. And I just hope that that becomes it. When looking at the EU as a concept got me very excited. I was like, ooh, this is an opportunity for us to have a look at what would that look like for the Americas and all the way down to the tip and all the way down to the top, right? Up to the top. Um, what would that look like? And you know, in a pipe dream for me, I would snap my fingers and have that happen tomorrow because uh, it's so beautiful. Yeah, and you can still have your languages and your dialects and you can oh. still have, uh, you know, these, these rough borders, but you have the freedom to work and travel and move and, and, and that, that it's a really nice thing. If, if we go back to, and I, I don't, I hope I'm not opening up a rabbit hole, but if we go back into or early antiquity, Mesopotamia, Aztecs, Incas, Mayas, you know, the ancient Greece, ancient Rome, ancient uh, uh, Persian uh, civilizations. We have more than 12 civilizations that don't exist anymore. They didn't exist. I mean, the Roman Empire was basically Europe and much Europe and much more. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was all that, you know, it wasn't divided and, and many, many other examples, but all of them, except for two collapse because of ecological or environmental collapse and two collapse because of some form of conflict or, or other reasons, but they're not around anymore. And so uh, this not only pandemic, but uh, craziness with um, leadership borders, walls and, and division of uh, humanity is really not working for us all anymore. It's not, uh, uh, it's, you know, the Trumpocalypse, the Bolsonaro's, the Putin's, the Shays, the Duarte's, the Erdogan's, whoever we want to name, they're not, they're not speaking for all of us. It's not working. Uh, we, we need some better system. And I really like this, um, you know, this vision of being a global citizen and, and removing these borders, walls and limitations. Um, and also a lot of the, the labels and divisions of humanity, no matter uh, uh, what, what race or religion or nationality or culture that you are, that you can still have that, but uh, that it doesn't divide us. It doesn't uh, make you less equal of a human being. So I um, had the fortunate uh, a couple of days ago uh, also, maybe four days ago, I had a, a podcast interview. It's already been released with a, a Hindu Ibrahim. She's a United Nations Sustainable Development Goal advocate, and she represents the indigenous people's voice globally, all of them from the Arctic to uh, Africa to Congo, everywhere. And she's from Chad, and she's from a pastoral nomadic tribe. And uh, her, her whole life is uh, almost like a global citizen because she doesn't her 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 culture her tribe her family they don't just stay in and and chad they travel thousands of kilometers all uh, you know throughout the year uh, with their cattle and their herds and and they're very global citizens she also expressed a similar similar feeling about that as well so that that's nice to hear. Thank you so much. That about resources just before we yeah, move on, Mark. Sure. What you're describing is a group of humans who have 
figured it out, right? Like to be that, what are you? Ultimately, all of us are chasing being present now. We've decided that what we've been reaching for this whole time is just to be radically present. That the moments matter. We can't live there. We can't live here. You're not there. You're here. And so imagine that. Literally, which way is the wind going? What's the temperature? Where's the water source? Let's just work on those things so I can just be and enjoy the gift that is this. Right? And so we have those moments, but they're fleeting. A lot of people chase them with psychedelics now. They try to do anything they can to be present, where all the tools are already built in, but capitalism has ruined it for us because we're constantly in chase. What was the next thing or the goal that I have to achieve? It's never yes. enough. The yeah. word enough is, it just doesn't exist in our vernacular in North America, right? It couldn't be enough. And so when people say, I don't understand why you act the way that you did, the, the, what you're doing with business, you had a different trajectory. And we were, our trajectory was in for-profit business, just skyrocketing, right? And I realized that that was literally the most empty and the least I liked myself. I was the worst version of myself. I was a bully. I didn't like the way that I interacted with anybody, including myself. Same with me. Yeah. Right? Because you're just chasing a thing that's unattainable and also looking for acceptance for all the wrong reasons. Now, when we spend time with nomadic tribe or with a farmer who's literally fifth generation on the land and they're with their children or their family or their energy or their beliefs and their chosen deity, de deities, they got it figured out. That's what it's about, right? And so they're not judgmental of the rest of these things because a group over here is judgmental of them. And resource, we know that there's more than enough to go around, more than enough. There's abundance everywhere of resource, but we've added this construct that doesn't serve us and really has destroyed us. And we're aware of it, but we don't see an alternative. And I believe that the alternatives are, have always been, right? We see them, we know what they are. So the, the chase, and you know, I never thought that I would be the guy that would be like anti-capitalist, right? <laughs> because I didn't know what it meant. Right? I thought it meant that I had to be a pauper. And it doesn't. It's not, it's not what that means. A, a B Corp, a, a sustainable development business model, a resilient business model, it's just a more efficient, better business model. It, it's just, it reduces your cogs and, and increases profits. At, to be sustainable is to sustain not your, only you and your employees and your business for future generations, but to have the resources to produce your products, to produce your foods, to produce whatever you want to offer as your offering. And if you do that without harm to people and planet, my God, what a better business model. What a business romance to have people come in and say, I love to come here. I love to buy your product there because you guys are going to be around for a while. You care about me and, and you care about our, our world and our kitchen, our world bank. You know, it's not some brick and mortar place. It's right exactly. there. It's, it's where all our resources are. So I, I love that, that way of thinking and, and the way you frame that. Do you believe that there is a plan, an earth shot, a climate shot, a moon shot to get us at least to 2030? or to get us to a more sustainable future? The latter, yes. But I, I believe that we've passed the point of what we were falsely holding on to, right? And so let me just dig into that a little bit more. When we think about, and I'm looking at the map very specifically, if we think <laughs> about a Miami or a California yeah. as they currently exist, that's over. Right. Like that's, that's not, it can no longer be a discussion point. Right. You've got to be planning. Right. You're looking for higher ground. You, you got to be looking for higher ground. You have to be thinking, how do we survive this versus how do we reverse this? Because we're, we're not, no matter what we do, unless we come up with some real magic, there's not a way to reverse what we've already impacted or affected. What we have to do is then mitigate it getting any worse. Right. So when we say, what are the practices that we can change? And one, one thing that just came to my mind is I'm aware in everything that we do that we have impact. So we're going to do 670,000 containers, individual containers this year that we need to put food in because people can't gather like I used to serve. In that, I'm talking with the manufacturer of those things yesterday 
And she's thrilled because a chemical has been realized in a lot of these compostable and biodegradable things that actually is damaging. And she's going to be the first one to pull it out. And so we're creating a product together that has zero footprint, right? And we're working on that together. This stuff matters, right? Every part of this chain matters, not for me, because we're in the place that we're in. But the other part of us looking at history and looking at the planet is we've lost lots of species. We've lost lots of things. We can mourn that and we can be aware of it. We can try and conserve and be as mindful and as diligent and as aggressive about this as we are daily. But we also have to be realists and we have to plan because the people who are going to be impacted by this climate change in particular are the marginalized, right? So how are we using our privilege, awareness, science? Science is really, really important. I know in current media, especially in the US, we're like, oh, forget science. Let me just read some numbers. That's not how the world works. Um, we need to listen and we need to be aware and we need to, instead of panicking and um, disassociating, which people do constantly, it's, it's the plague of our existence is disassociative behavior, right? This is our planet. We're on it together. It's, we're part of it. We're made from it. It's made from us. How do we plan appropriately? And then just start to have non-negotiables with our consumerism. We have to have non-negotiables and say, I absolutely will not do A, B, C, D, or E. And I won't name names because I think we're all aware of what I would say yeah, in those yeah. blanks, right? Yeah. We have to have those non-negotiables socially and as family units and as cultural units. And then we change behavior. The dollar, the same dollar that's broken us will listen to us. If we all suddenly stopped going online to purchase our next pen, there would be a reaction from that. And that reaction would be positive both to small business, to family units, to all of it. I, I don't um, want to negate anything that you've said because I also feel that. But in some respect, you're being a little bit dystopian, a little pessimistic about sure. can, can, can we reverse it? You know, uh, are we, we've got, you're using words like mitigation and you're using words like this resilience. So now there's three main definitions of, of resilience. You know, there's sure. the dystopian resilience where we're gas mass and oxygen mass and spacesuits to enjoy our planet. Then there's the, the resilience that you know very well if somebody calls you a name or hits you or abuses you that you have the resilience to mentally and physically, emotionally bounce back and and, and make it through that difficult time, the loss of someone, et cetera. Uh, and then there's this resilient, desirable futures where you still enjoy beautiful, clean water and fresh air and our planet and a green nature. And you don't have to have these limiting restrictions, another form of walls, borders, and boundaries to enjoy right. nature and our world or each other. And, and right now, we're at this, this point, social distancing, personal protection equipment that you know very well in, in the food business and then, you know, a healthcare business. And then these face masks, right? I, I mean, you know, George not only said, I can't breathe, but we, I can't breathe. It mm -hmm. is hot in these masks. And, and in Thailand, um, they when we were there, they were wearing them. I think almost three months prior to our arrival because I the air pollution was so bad mm -hmm. and it wasn't because of uh, COVID or a virus. It was because the air pollution was so bad. And yeah. so let's push that model forward. Mm -hmm. um, what's the next step? Is it a gas mask? Is it an oxygen mask? So Mark, not only, uh, is that dystopian to move forward with these other type of, you know, uh, gas mask spacesuits for the future? But I do believe there is a plan. Um, 193 countries came together for the first time ever. Historical precedence, 2015. And before the Paris Agreement, this is what a lot of people don't know, September 24th, all these countries agreed upon the sustainable development goals, 17 goals, plus mm -hmm. hundreds of targets and indicators as a roadmap to get us to 2030, to keep us at that time, before the Paris Agreement, it was two point uh, degrees of, of 
warming to hold us there. Right. And then at the Paris Agreement, they set a bold ambition and says, let's make it 1.5 and go a little extra. And so then there were some tweaks and adjustments made. But that is the earth shot, the moon shot, the climate mm -hmm. shot, the roadmap to get us there. It's a true plan. It's not only done with backcasting from 2030 to 2015 when we started or should have started, let's say it that way. Um, and now we're five years into it. The decade of action is started this year, 20, 2020. And it is, it is, it is a roadmap and it is doable especially if we believe and understand the exponential function, which occurred the beginning of this year. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of ambitions, a lot of corporations, a lot of countries, a lot of people got on board and said, we're implementing them in our business plans. We're implementing them in our policies. We're going to achieve them. And it's not just reversing, stopping and reversing. It's going that extra step further to actually clean up our planet, make it better than we found it. Circular economy principles and things like that. Sure. I'm going to ask you another question after that, but I believe you have something to tell me about this. What, what yeah, I just sure. mentioned. Okay. Well, I, I mean, first of all, I learn a lot from you in this space, right? So I just want to really. Um, oh, you're fine put that there and be like your talk in Thailand as well. Open my eyes up as a, a lifelong purveyor and creator of food and its impact on our systems. Um, but also as a design thinker and a deep believer in, in reversal, right? So while my answer was very much from the lens of my friend, Jeff Goodall, right. Is like, this is, you know, pay attention because we're the stacks are still pumping. Well, they're not. And of course, in the last four months, what we've seen and just these success stories and the cleanliness and the planet breathing easier and what that did vastly outweighed anybody's predictions of what would actually happen, right? So when we saw the results, science, again, we know that they're incredible, right? My question is, can we look past the dollar? And if the US is any indication, or 150,000 encroaching on very quickly dead because of capitalism. And let's, let's not, you know, we don't need no, to skirt I, I'm around the issue. right in line with you. I right. believe it because this, of capitalism. This is because of money is why we're trying to, you want to jumpstart the economy, which is just going to shut it back down. It's all about money. Right. And so living in this. So when we talked, when you said the other earlier about being um, a global citizen, I have never been prouder to be Canadian in this moment. Right. We said, shut it all down, give everybody UBI. So they didn't use that language, but that's what they did. They gave everybody $2,000 to live on. And there was almost zero application. They said, do not, everything is closed. We're not going to do this. We're going to, when businesses reopen, subsidize 75% of rent through a mixed media model. Uh, we're going to subsidize 75% of small and medium and large business payroll to make sure we get our workforce back to work. And we're going to do it completely and utterly safely. That's what governance looks like. Right. And so the governance wasn't based on money because if it was, we wouldn't be going into another trillion dollars in deficit. The government's like, this is a long play. We want to keep people alive and safe. We're not looking at the next six months of selling wings at Hooters. Yeah. We're looking at <laughs> keeping people alive and showing that we know how to govern through a moment like this. Now, is it perfect? Of course not. But it was brilliant. And it's, it's incredible because I, I'm still dumbfounded and I'm a small business owner, right? We get a check from the government two days ago for $22,000 to subsidize one of my spaces. That's like, my God, this is my government showing up for me. Wait, this is humanity showing up for humanity. So if we look at this the same way, if we're protecting people and we look at the existential crisis that is, I like that we say existential crises because <laughs> we're in multiple. Yeah, right? we are. The existential crisis that is COVID, sure, pales in comparison to the crisis of climate. Climate, yeah. So we become focused on climate again. And we're like, oh, right. Okay. This was real bad. But, you know, I love the analogy of the tsunami waves in showing COVID and then showing climate change. And we've seen that it can be reversed. We've seen that it, it works. My, my dystopian portion comes from the almighty dollar. Right. And, and of course, I will, I, I'm a forever optimist as well. 
but I, I think that my response to that knee jerk is also because I feel like people are detached from reality. I feel so, like they don't listen or believe. If I may, I want to tell you two things about that. I'm in total alignment and agreement with you about capitalism that uh, tie very well into that. The first one is, uh, is uh, well, let me start with the dystopian one first. In sure. 2008, we shifted all our, our investments and financial interests from technology and, and automotive and internet and, and whatever to the majority part to food systems. And in 2008, our food systems became a commodity. Mm -hmm. Capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. we, it was no longer about the farmers, the food producers, and the cherishing of food and how it's made. It's a commodity. It has to be done cheap and fast and in abundance. And we, it doesn't matter if we waste it. We've got to sell it as cheap as possible and get the biggest bang for the buck out of it. Right. right? Happened in 2008 and has really messed us up to, to this date. And, and that's a really negative thing that we see how capitalism has affected our industry, our, our livelihood. But more so, it's not just an industry. It is the fundamental basic resource of humanity. It's our energy source. Without mm -hmm. that, there is nothing. Without our biodiversity, without that sustainable development goals for uh, life on land, life below water, clean water and sanitation, climate change, our biodiversity, we can't produce nothing. Not a watch, not a phone, not a car, not food. Mm -hmm. And so we really have to cherish that. And that goes, it also ties in to that question I mentioned in the beginning about the global citizens and the nation's walls and borders and divisions. What one thing during our lockdown, our pandemic remained open and is a global citizen? Food. Mm -hmm. Even though we wasted a lot of it and there was a lot of issues around it and it was hurt, good, bad, and that ugly, on the other hand, it was the only industries that continue to go to continue to balance because they are an essential. It's our energy source. And second of all, the nations and borders have always been gone when it's in regards to food and trade, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so when you put that into perspective, how can humanities, uh, uh, human beings not be global citizens or be divided up by walls, nations, and borders, but yet our vital energy source is not. Exactly. And, and I, I think that, you know, you, you mentioned uh, pr President Barack Obama uh, talked about, hey, we could be facing a pandemic. We should prepare. We should make some measures. And then um, he, I, I believe he did as well. He did. Uh, and, and then Trump came in and was like, oh, no, it's not that important. And the capitalist portion of that was, um, and I don't want to generalize it or, or, or that because it's a very serious thing and it needs to be respected and taken seriously. Of course. But to say we're going to, to get the cheapest mass produced and gloves and personal protection equipment produced in China, China's not the enemy, but they're able to produce pennies on the dollar products cheaply and let's just order the minimum stock just the minimum it's it's like saying let's order one sheet of toilet paper and then when i need the second sheet then then we'll go to the store and buy it totally you know that's capitalism and, and budgeting and turning food into a commodity so that's the negative part of it but all 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are tied to agriculture, seafood, food, and beverages. Of course. They're our life source. And during this pause and reset, not only have those companies been affected the hardest, food and gastronomy the worst, uh, uh, and many other sectors, people not getting foods, children not getting food because they're mm -hmm get their food from school and now at home, they're getting one meal a day, if that, all sorts of multifaceted problems. Definitely. But environmental social governance stocks and investments have weathered during this first quarter and mm -hmm. during the pandemic better than their counterparts 
that were based on fossil fuels and other things correct so well and so mm -hmm. and, and the last the, before i shut up and go too far because i know your voice is vital and i want to hear it earth overshoot last year was july 29th because of the pause and the reset it's now august 22nd which is 24 days increase that we've gained because we're not moving we're calming we're connecting Critical with numbers. nature we're figuring out what's the better business model to work on how do we want to move forward it's not a new normal it's the great reset it's a fundamentally different than we did before and Absolutely. and i love that there's countries and individual nations and and governance like canada like you mentioned that are providing like that but there's so many that aren't that are just are failing us all over and that's why we really need a global system we need something new definitely i think there's so much in what you just said and i, I want to bring it granular and i'll go back out um chef hat on all right so i get back from thailand i'm with you I have three dinners in Los Angeles, particularly around school food and school hunger. And I partner with an organization there called Swipe Out Hunger. We do teaching at LA Tech. So I do a lot of instruction on food agency, advocacy, sovereignty, the dispel the myth of the food desert and replace it with the proper word apartheid, right? This is race relations stuff. These are designed. This isn't by happenstance. There's, there's no desert in Oakland, right? Yeah. There's a desert in the Sahara. But yeah. there's racism in Oakland. So yeah. we, we work on these projects and it hits. I, I see it hitting when I'm with you, right? We fly into, I fly into Los Angeles. I do these dinners. I'm already warning people, if you're feeling any sort of fever or temperature or any sort of gastritis or anything, please stay home. And people think I'm being a little too aggressive. I'm like, no, this is, it's coming. So I get back here and I think immediately to myself, how are we going to be in service? I'm used to being on the road 300 days a year like you, right? How am I in service from this eight by 10 that I'm sitting in right now? I've been here for four months, more now at this point. What does it look like to be in service? Well, what are people gonna do? Cause they're gonna be like me. They're sitting home, they got $2,000 a month. What are they gonna do? And so we start teaching cooking. And I'm like, well, I have, to, I have to be with, so all of my own assumptions and tropes that I'm carrying around, convening, you know how I feel about convening, gathering, yes. it's yes. so important. I'm pulled into Zoom calls 10 times a day. I hate them instantly. I'm like, I don't like this. Like, what if, you, what if you stopped saying that to yourself? What if you embrace the technology, embrace the presence, if you could imagine and fill in the gaps, because you can, you can energetically feel Mark right now. How do you do that? And how do you show up in service? So I think to broil all of our analogies down, being aware of time, I developed this one program called Sharpen Up. All right, and Sharpen Up, we were doing in Los Angeles, in Oakland, in San Francisco, in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, in Harlem with the New York City Food Bank, which is in the council of. We were doing these in person. We were going to where people were in community centers. I was bringing induction burners. I'm bringing a gang of chefs and we're just cooking and we're cooking what's at the bodega. We're cooking whatever we is naturalized in that environment. Well, we can't do that. So it's a full like hardcore stop. So I get 15 people together via Zoom. I send questionnaires out to them. What do you want to eat? What would you like to learn? What, what interests you? And when I say people, I mean nine-year-olds to about 23-year-olds. Yeah. And we start teaching via this medium and power comes from knowledge. We're just aware that that is how that centers. Our fuel source is our greatest source of power. It's food. It is everything. It's, it's literally in the circles of the Venn diagram of whatever diagram you draw. If it's not in there, nothing else goes. And your mental health and your physical health and your confidence, everything is directly attached to it. So how do we teach more of it? And I got to watch people growing tomatoes in their windowsill. I got all sorts of this, like you would never have done that. You've only eaten out of cans and boxes your literal entire life. And now you're like, wait a second, I could grow in my backyard, right? The Karen Washingtons of the world are suddenly like, thank you, 30 years I've been telling you this, let's go. And so we've seen this idea and understanding that not only is food power for self, but the cost of actually producing it may mean that I don't have to work three jobs. Maybe the way that I'm living is just completely backwards. Maybe this chase for the dollars never made me happy. But food is the center point of that conversation. So I think it's really important. The only other thing that I want to address in what you said around PPE, in my personal disgust around it comes around from us losing so many people to police violence. 
the typical riot police outfit in gear is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment. PPE properly is about 50 bucks. Yeah. We didn't have PPE. Well, we yep. saw how many riot police we had. Yep. So what are we doing? That in itself is worth an exploration of destabilizing I mean, our governments. Yeah. Like, what do we do? You could push it further with a, you know, military as well. I mean, who are we protecting ourselves against? Exactly. Who are we protecting ourselves against? Other global citizens, which are distant cousins, distant human beings. They're our brothers, our sisters, our closest relatives. That they, they weren't dropped off on planet Russia, or planet China, or planet Germany. We're all homo sapiens, you know, uh, we're protecting each other against each other. And that's insanity. And um, I mean, that's a, that's a much deeper and, and, and different problem. But being from food, dealing with food as we do, food is a, a binder of humanity. Food is companionship and stories and culture. And it brings and binds people together, it solves problems. There's no event of the thousand events that we go to every year, travel all over. The food isn't somewhere there. Or, and if it's not, you're, you're saying, where's the food? I'm starving. Okay, <laughs> Sorry, forget about the conference. I've got to go get something to eat. If you guys exactly. didn't figure that part out, you know, yeah. um, it, it, it's, it's a big thing. And so I, I, we, I think we kind of went down a little rabbit hole, but I just needed to, to, to get it out there and I know it's in you, but I, I don't want to, uh, don't be so pessimistic. I want you to have hope and optimism that we, I appreciate will, that. we will draw down. Um, and the way we'll do it is actually the one that we've done. So the biggest impact on, on our human health and human suffering and our environment, it's agriculture, seafood and beverages. It's not the mm -hmm. oil, coal and gas industry, the telco or the automotive industry. It's our industry as because of how we produce and how we package and how we transport and how we waste. And I think what I've seen from you, that's a different story. That doesn't happen or that's something that's a no-no and it's our, you, you've got that ingrained in, in what you do and it's well thought out. But we need to get it in the rest of those who produce and in the rest of the world to change the food systems from a commodity to something else because it will be the biggest impact in our world and it will be an exponential function um, to, to, to solve some of these problems in these are worlds. I, I think we are beyond the limits to growth and we're going to see suffering. We're going to see climate catastrophes well worse than we've ever seen before, but there's a way that we can get back in the safe operating space of our planetary boundaries and kind of get a rebalancing of things uh, for future generations. I hope I'm around to see it. I hope mm. you are as well. Um, that leads me right off to the most difficult question, I'll, unless you have something else to say. No, to I just, uh, okay. I couldn't possibly with this preemption. <laughs> what have you got? The burning question, WTF, and it's okay. not the swear word, it's what's the future, and not the future for others, the future for Mark Brand. What's the future? It's a great question. And, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll answer it two ways. Number one, I believe deeply that it's determined and that I need to listen and be present and follow it, All right? So I, I believe that part. If I have to, you know, describe it, it's very much an exponential education. Right. So I want, I want people to learn and feel and see and be right. And so I want them to develop everything that I build is around helping people develop empathy for other. And I never say that, right. I'll develop like our token system. Our token system was, I created it with my team to specifically have two humans from different socioeconomic backgrounds, understand each other, because that's how you start advocacy is with a spark. What people thought they were doing was being generous which they were, but what the, the Trojan horse is, you're realizing that just because somebody's in poverty, that doesn't mean that they're dirty or different or weird, or it, it means that you just haven't met them yet. And so in these processes, all the skill sets that I've learned up until this point and everything that I have in that tool belt we talked about earlier, 
it will be to continue to help us see how easy it is to truly be in service, right? Because what we've done so far is we've made this great magical mystery of the great orgs and the work that they do and everything from the UN and having been there a year ago, three days ago, um, being in those halls, realizing this is just a group of humans who want the world to be a better place. Let's stop like adding all this mystique to it and just make it really easy for every person to be involved in solving and healing their own communities. That's what we've got. And that's our best shot at all of this, right? Is this communicative mycelium of communities and the globe, right? We talk about it with the fungal network and with trees and the redwoods, et cetera, but we have it. We Energetically, have it. we have it in love. It's there for us to access. And so my job, as I see it, is to spend every moment that I've got helping to facilitate these systems and be part of the healing portion of it, right? Because again, in this presence and in, in, in the spirit of we have this moment, to stop the suffering of all those moments. So many people will not get to have joyous experiences. And that's, I think that's one of the great failures of humanity and of society rather, not of humanity. But one of our greatest failures is that we, we preach the ability for everyone, but we build structures that further marginalize them. So if we can just stay, those structures are being destabilized naturally because they were unsustainable to begin with. But as they, destabilize instead of looking how we fix them throwing trillions of dollars at banks to save them we could just get everybody fed and we could get everybody housed and we could say you know what makes a lot of sense a 25 hour work week makes a lot of sense and yeah. you watch productivity go through the roof and if you want to work from home i'm good with that like the way that we govern our teams people are like "Ooh, that's a little hippie I'm like what is it 1975 what are you talking yeah, about a little seriously, hippie. we want people to be happy safe and productive when you give people trust, and this goes back right to the center point of this border conversation, I trust people. Well, nobody's trying to come take my stuff. I mean, I don't really have much, but they don't want my stuff. They just want safety. They want freedom. They want the ability to raise their families. They want to have freedom of spirit and religion and just to do the things that they want. And if we give people those things, all the abundance that these people, these dictators that you're talking about look for, would 100x. What they don't realize is they would get everything they would ever dream of plus, plus, plus. Yes. Because what I'm certain of, and for me, is the second that I stopped chasing money and that I started chasing just helping people understand and be accepted, that was when my whole life turned around. All my joy came, all my happiness came, my understanding came, I was able to be present, I slowed down. So for me, I want to continue to develop those tools for self and for, for others. I think my listeners are probably at a little bit of a disadvantage because I don't think they got to hear you speak, um, even though you've spoken all over the world in many different places. Is there a little mess message uh, similar to what you give on stage or maybe even what you gave in, in uh, Thailand that you would like to share with us, uh, kind of Mark Brand's message? Um, to humanity, uh, that they can get an insight of what you talk about. And uh, be, we've heard of business aspects, we've heard about some other things, but when you get on stage or when you're out there giving your message, you mind sharing a little bit of that with us? Yeah, and I'm gonna just share what comes to the top for me. Sure, that's fine. I, I think what, when we disassociate, because we do when we're, when we're under attack, and when we feel like we're not enough or imposter syndrome kicks in, which everybody battles with, or one in four of us is mentally ill in some way. And um, all of those things need to be normalized, first of all. Like we need to just be okay with that. That's not weakness, it just is. Um, that mental health and physical health are the same thing. That we all have mental health, but we don't all have mental illness. And um, we also all have physical health, but we don't all have physical illness, right? And so I have both. And I seem to operate just fine. <laughs> like I'm very able and capable and I, I know how to navigate those things because I've accepted them instead of trying to fight against them. And when you accept them, they become part of your superpower, right? And I think that every single person has the opportunity to understand what they're capable of 
And because of the capitalism, and again, the structures that we're built with, we're told that we're less than. And social media has destroyed a lot of that and people's self-worth and their confidence. And I, we're seeing a bit of a change in what's important, right? And so I, I ask people just to, to feel more into themselves and to think more about that. Right, is, is what makes you happy? And every once in a while, you'll have a friend in your circle who's like, I'm moving to Salt Spring Island or I'm moving to Thailand. And, and you're like, oh, that person's crazy. And maybe they're not. Maybe yeah. they've actually just figured out what makes them happy. And they've done everything in their, their power to make that a, a real thing for them. In my life, I've been a dishwasher lots of times. Um, I've had zero resource many times. Uh, I've been sued by multinationals and had my reputation run through the mud. Uh, I've been addicted to narcotics and alcohol many times. Um, I've been a, a bad, by my definition, person. Uh, I've been a wonderful person. And what I know is that none of that is current. What's current is what I've decided today, what I've decided. So you're not your past. You can't be. You can't, you, unless you, that's what you want to be and you're holding on to that. Um, all that you can do now is be the best version of yourself that you want to be. And so, you know, I don't want to get too Tony Robbins with it, but at the end of the day, you have decisions. You make thousands of them every hour, right? Micro decisions and major decisions you make every day. With those decisions, you have to sort of start to scaffold and ladder what it is that you want to do and how you want to show up. So when I decided, I have this very deep recollection being 19 and I was a, I got my first bartending job on a coastal, uh, at a coastal restaurant called the Rope Loft. And I was the doorman and I was the bartender and it was fishing. It was wealth versus inequality, right? So it was wealth and poverty in there. So it's like a Cape Cod, if you will, at Chester, Nova Scotia. So there's these super wealthy Americans coming in and these, these fishermen who are hard drinking, there'd be a fight every night. So I'm over <laughs> the bar and I'm breaking up fights and it's super violent. And you're seeing these tensions that have been around since serfdom, right, around. And I said to myself, I, and at a party actually said out loud as well, and it was me going away party, I was moving to Australia. I said, I'm gonna own my own restaurant one day. And one of the gentlemen who was there and looked at me, he was like, yeah, cause bullshit's Nova Scotian and Nova Scotian's bullshit. And I am 45 next week. That has never left me as motivation. I was like, that's so crazy that your structure, and at the time for me, that felt like he's probably right. He was obviously very wrong. I've owned and operated 11 restaurants with no investment. You can literally do anything, right? And the constraints that are placed upon you by other people, that doesn't belong to you, that belongs to them. And so just a consistent acknowledgement that other people's, their interpretation of what they're capable of has nothing to do with you. Right. And so if you had said to me on that same night, you're going to hang out with one of the most impactful people in the global food movement who literally leads at the UN and you guys are going to be in Thailand together. I'd be like, pass me that joint because <laughs> I like what you're smoking. Right. But at the end of the day, when you dedicate your life to service, the world opens up to you. Everything. If you look at on paper, my history, my first time in jail was 14 years old, right? Like this is like the first time I got arrested and locked up overnight. My trajectory was not to be at the United Nations last year, helping to instill September 29th. As old as but it is because yeah. I decided that I was built for something different and we all are. And I think that if I could share any message, it really truly is that the only limitations that you will ever face in life are your own that, that you set for yourself. Thank you for sharing that. I know you, um, you always say, I fucking love you, or you have that up and you show your, you, <laughs> you, you I probably show it at the end, but you give it, yeah, love hard. Yeah. I, I love you, brother. I appreciate it. We have uh, not only because we cross the pass in Thailand, but we, we also have a lot of mutual friends, uh, Harold Neidhart and wonderful Hatch and, and um, the people that we know and uh, are, you know, I, I would even say not even three degrees of separation, you know. Um, so it was bound and determined that we come together one way or the other. Um, exactly. Has there been anything that during this pause that has been an influential read or view or connection 
that has touched your life or changed anything that you would like to share with us, uh, maybe that would give us a little bit of, of help or inspiration that you say, yeah, man, I, did you read this book or have you heard this? Sure. Yeah, uh, I'll go granular and then big again. Okay, okay. granular. Everybody needs to buy a book called Tell Me About Yourself. And it's written by my dear friend, uh, Holly Murchison. All right. Um, we can link it in the podcast, but it is Holly and I met at the Stanford D school. Um, and her and I were there on a trial to see who was going to attend with a group of other people. And, um, she is a black queer goddess. Yeah, she is. You know, she, I've read so the book special. and I've seen, yeah. I've seen her stuff. She's fabulous. Oh. So. That's that. That's my human. Her and her wife, Dr. Coley, are are just so dear to me. And I revisited that book. I I actually it was the first foreword or part of a foreword or cosign, whatever you call it, that I'd ever had published. Wow, it was with Holly. And I just think that again, in that vein of how can you best be of service? Well, you need to love yourself. You need to understand yourself, and you need to understand how to introduce yourself. Like those things are critical skills in just navigating this thing we called life. So that <clears throat> and directly attached, educating yourself on the last 400 years of global oppression of black, indigenous, and people of color, and as well as the oppression of sexuality, right? So when we think about those things, when you say we're all homo sapiens, fuck yeah, we are, right? And, but we can't, and we have intrinsic wiring and generational trauma from things that have happened around us and to others that we carry and that trauma inf informs a lot of bias it and does. so to remove that bias and do personal work and and really figure out how you can show up for people who have uh, been on the wrong end of this thing for a long time has of course been at the centerpiece of our work for over a decade and that's and i say this is fulfilling because when shit gets bad and it's bad right now as far as like bad is good in this analogy. As far as everybody seeing what's happening, they're like, oh my God, I can't believe that I didn't recognize my own privilege. That's that. That's the homework. The homework is to understand and love yourself, to know that you, you're not going backwards. You can't take back that un, unassumingly racist thing that you said at the office. You can't take it back. You can own it. Yeah. And then you can go forward in a way <clears throat> that is honoring all peoples. Did Support. you get, did you get, you got the granular and the big. So, okay. We, I've got two more questions for you. Please. And then we'll wrap it up. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Mm, beautiful question. Uh, it means that people are allowed to show up in their true genius. Everybody, everybody is able to do exactly what fulfills them. So uh, using an analogy very quickly, we have dozens of requests a week to come and work with us or volunteer with us. And I've used this, I've told you this story before, but I think it really, it hits for people. And the majority of those requests come to me directly <clears throat> and they say, pardon me, chef, I would love to cook with you and help people. And I say, do you know how to cook? And nine times out of 10, like, I have no idea. And I'm like, how is that valuable? And I mean, no offense by this. I'm just being pragmatic. You want me to give you a free cooking lesson where you come in my kitchen and you mess up the flow of 1,800 people getting fed, get burnt, cut yourself, do something. You're going to feel terrible about it. Trust me. Because you're going to feel like a fish out of water. And then you're not going to do it. You might not volunteer ever again. I don't want that responsibility. What do you do? And people are like, ah, I'm a UX designer. That's not helpful. Like, oh my God. Uh, yeah, of course. Have you seen a nonprofit website lately? <laughs> You're like, of course that's helpful. Let me introduce you to somebody that could use that skill. This goes back 10 years. <clears throat> I'm a CPA, chartered accountant. That's not helpful. I'm like, oh my God. You are literally the resource, right? Like, uh, let me volunteer, give that two hours a day. I'm writing a book right now. It's just about finished. And the book is a guide. It's a guidebook. It's around 90 pages about finding where your sweet spot is and how to show up in purposeful volunteerism or that may then divert into being your life. I want everybody to have that skill set. 
right? So if you'd asked me 10 years ago, Mark, you're going to go back to cooking. In fact, you're going to be the chef for Pope Francis's climate change challenge. And it said, I'll be like, I think I remember how to make chicken wings. Right? I didn't realize until I looked deep into myself, how much I loved cooking, how I started my career cooking at 14 and how I was going to then spend the next seven to eight years daily sharpening, pun intended, that skill set to be deeply in service to everybody and using that as a tool. That's what I want for everyone. If you are a stand-up comic, there is a place for you. If you want to literally read tea leaves on the corner for people, that is exactly what you should be doing. And in the way that we have enough resource, if everybody was actually allowed to do that, we would not live in a weird society where nobody works. It would be the opposite. I've seen it. People want to give away their time and skill set and resource. We just don't trust them enough to, to implement it. And so with a UBI, universal, universal basic, basic income for the listeners, um, you have that. You have the safety to explore your creativity, what skill set you want. People who are accountants like being accountants. You know, people who are firemen and women love that job. They love saving people. They love doing it. So critical services don't fall apart. They're just allowed to be exactly who they want to be. And the other part, I think, for people is you can live many, many, many lives, right? You can be the next version of you tomorrow. And if that next version of you decides that you want to be a fly fishing instructor, you should absolutely do that. And you should teach the conservation of our rivers and have replenishing fish stocks and everything should be catch and release. But you should do that. And I think that the, the planet, as we would see it, would be that, that we would understand that responsibility isn't intrinsic to capitalism, that people have deeper responsibility and senses of it, that we should just trust them with it. I totally agree. Thank you for sharing. One of my very first podcasts was with uh, author John P. Strelinke. He's written numerous books, but the Y Cafe and the Big Five for Life, the Big Five for Life continued and the Y Cafe continued. He, uh, uh, Safari, um, many others, but he says your purpose for existing and what is your big five for life? You know, these, uh, and it's kind of related to Africa hunting the, the big five game or seeing the big five game uh, uh, that there are in Africa. Don't uh, by any means know hunting. It's more so to, to have seen them in their natural habitat. Um, but what are, what are your big five? What are your big, what's your purpose for existing? And that's exactly what you, you've said and what you've discovered, but uh, everybody has that. And, and, and it can be accounting, it can be a comedian, it can be any of those things that gives you that feeling that you're special, that you're, you have a talent, that you enjoy it, that you'd leap out of bed every day to do that. Those are the, the future of work, you know? So we've learned in this, this pause and in this great reset that people can work from home. They can have that pause that the, a lot of these offices and meetings and spaces are unnecessary. Um, the work can still get done in that. And there, there are some that cannot, uh, of course, there's always sure. that, but there are different ways of doing that. There's not just one uniform or one way for us all. We can find our unique spots. So I really like that. The and last, also I think just, yeah? just to say yes, Anne, before you answer this question, <clears throat> we're talking about a skill set, but what does the skill set provide? Accounting provides safety and clarity. So you're actually a purveyor of safety and clarity. You're not a purveyor of numbers, right? And so I always say that to people too, because they, they mess up what it is that they're doing. Laughter is critical. It's not a maybe, it's not a nice to have. If you're not laughing every day, you're doing life wrong, right? You have to. And so to have the beautiful poet comedians that allow us to reflect our political states and say, they're essential workers. Right? So I, I didn't mean that in a flippant way. I just wanted to clarify. No, I know. I know you didn't mean it that way. I took it the right way. And I think our right. listeners got it. But thank you for clar clarifying. Uh, as we wrap this up, the, the last thing is, is, so 
One, is there anything that you would like to say to our listeners that you did not touch upon? But more importantly, if you could have the chance to go up to all the billions of people on this earth individually, one-on-one, and give them just one message, your message, Mark's message, what would that be? I think it would be an ask. I don't think it would be a tell. I think it would be a prompt. And it's the prompt that I share from stage as well, right? And I think you got to, to see me do it with canoeing, which is a promise. It's a social contract, right? It's a socially binding contract that you make with one other human being. So I would make it with a billion people if I could. Fabulous. And it would be to promise to leave the world a better place than you found it. Just promise that. And whatever it is, whatever incremental change or gigantic change that is that you're going to make, know that it's all important. And so I, I just will share one quick story to give it context. There was a, a young lady working um, on soil and resilience, uh, working specifically for the organization Kiss the Ground. And I was cooking in Panama City, an off the grid uh, place called Kaliella. And she was there and she asked for some time and mentorship around homelessness. And they had a, uh, a little farm that they'd set up in Malibu and they had employed two gentlemen who were homeless um, to do the farming. And she was so thrilled. She was so, so thrilled. Her name was Lauren with what they had achieved. And she was so excited about scale. She said, I can't wait to do more of this. Like you do more of this. And I said, why do you want to scale it? And she said, so we can get more people employed who are homeless. And I said, but you work on something very critical, which is food um, sovereignty and soil regeneration. And we've got 15 harvests less by, left by best count. That is critical to focus on for all of us. Otherwise we're all screwed. Um, why this? She's like, I just love seeing um, the men find that purpose. And I was like, have you asked them about it? Have you asked them about scaling? And she said, looked at me like I was a little crazy. She said, no, I have not. And I said, because by scaling, you could potentially destabilize them. And so think about what your impact is. Think about what's enough. Think about where your focal points are, where you put your energy. And as a lifelong, nonstop, addicted entrepreneur, um, I can tell you now running five organizations versus 13 cost centers, I am having way more impact by doing way less. Right. So I'm focused on the things that matter. And I, I said to Lauren, I said, those two men's lives are forever changed because of the work you're doing. If everybody impacted one or two people, there wouldn't be enough to go around. We would be arguing over who's going to help the next person. And we'd be looking for them versus driving through streets of unhoused, street entrenched, addicted, mentally ill, struggling humans from Bangladesh to Bangor, Maine. They're there. And you talk about office spaces being empty. We have the space to put people and to help them recover. We're choosing not to. Poverty is violence. It's a, it's a violent act that we've chosen. So I think if I could speak to everybody, I'd say, do your part. Just do your part and we'll be fine. But everybody has to participate. I heard and I will do. I will do my part. I promise you. And I, I'd like to um, continue seeing you and, and, uh, our paths will cross and we'll do some more things and we'll have a follow-up hopefully. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been absolutely a pleasure. I wish you all the best and um, have a great weekend. Thank you, brother. And, and, you and well. don't, don't work too hard. I, I promise I will. And, uh, <laughs> I know you will. And thank you for the time. I look forward to seeing you very soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.